Well, it's wonderful to have you join us on the program this morning. Thank you for having me. Nigerians, as we all know it, are a very, very resilient people, but yet faced with so many challenges that can be very backbreaking. From insecurity and banditry in the northeast and the northwest to issues of food, in, food crisis and food insecurity as well. And now we are being faced by a new fuel pump price that has caused many people to either park their cars or sell off their cars. Nigeria's mental health as a country is at the brink of collapse. What will be your reaction to this? Um, so when we talk about resilience and mirroring it with Nigeria's problems, it's very delicate because there's only so much you can push a person to a wall, right? But when we talk about resilience in the context of mental health, we're talking about adaptation and making the best of the situation that you can make within your reality, right? So if we're to hyper-focus on the problems and the problems and the problems, everybody's blood pressure is going to go up everybody's going to be out in the streets, violence and unrest is going to be there, right? And so when you talk about the things that are happening, they are very real, that is not to invalidate them, but also to remind Nigerians that they need to survive in these times. And it's very important to develop resilience on what is going on in the country now, rather than give in to like turmoil and unrest you know, which can have you being in the hospital or being extremely stressed or experiencing burnout and going into a critical condition. So the problems are many, but we have to find a way to survive, right? Yes, certainly. We have to find a way to survive. Nigerians have been doing that for a very long time. Now let's uh, look at the issue of mental health, uh, Angel. When, when, yes. when people think about stress, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, you are stressed, you need to rest so your body doesn't mm. break down and all of that. Mm. Most people forget that the brain can be stressed, not just by work, but by daunting realities and the challenges mm. that we face day to day mm. as a country. How mm. do we sensitize people to understand that stress does not only take a toll on the body, but it mm. can also take a toll on the mind or the brain, mm. which can lead to anxiety, mm. depression and the likes? Yeah, that's a really good question because if you look at evolution, right, if you follow evolution and just the passage of time, if you look at thousands and thousands of years ago, we were hunter gatherers, right? And so when you are hunter and caveman or person, you are in the caves hunting animals or animals are hunting you and your cortisol level rise up. Now we live in, you know, Lagos, you're in Abuja, there's no lion or elephant hunting you every day but we still have cortisol cortisol levels still right so it is very important that in as much as we no longer have these wild animals we still have things today that represent that to us and still make our stress levels high so it is very important that nigerians know when they are being stressed whether that is from work whether that's from family but most importantly in this conversation when it's coming from your country one of the important things to remember is learning to stay within the locus of your control. So it would be very maladaptive to, first of all, let's say, be looking at the exchange rate every day, just on a daily basis, keeping up with it, especially because you would just be hyper, you know, you would just be exhausted and stressed, right? Or constantly looking at like news that is very violent, that is very traumatic, that is very painful, right? So it is, again, really important that yes, these things are realities, but reducing your exposure to them can help you with your mental health. Increasing your exposure will not be good for your mental health in the long term. Well, still speaking about uh, mental health, uh, how, how can people have access to psychologists like you who help mm. people who are troubled mentally due to some of the strains mm. that uh, they face? I, I mean, I remember back mm. in the day, uh, comedy shows were quite big and uh, affordable for most people. But these days, it appears that if you don't have so much money, you can have access to these places mm. where comedy shows hold, where people can go and relieve the stress uh, that, mm -hmm. that has been burdening them. How do we close mm. up this gap and ensure that uh, a little bit of laughter gets to everyone? Mm. This is really good because like, one of the things about resilience, like I said earlier, is working within your current reality. So if we continue to look at the past right, and be like, we've lost this, we've lost this, we won't know what we now have. 
Um, right now, we live in one of the best times in the world where like we have the internet and we have data and we have access to things. I mean, I'm in Lagos, you're in Abuja, and we're having this conversation. So in terms of accessing mental health support services, right, there are state services, there are federal services. Now it's a different conversation if you look at the population versus the number of like doctors and professionals that we have in staff. And that is where free resources come, right? You have YouTube, you have Better Health, you have, you know, Nigerian organizations like Mentally Aware Nigeria, you know, Stance and Rape, you have Google, right? So there are a lot of resources and a lot of organizations that are championing this thing. Is it at the level that it would be that would help every single Nigerian realistically? Perhaps not, but the resources, the personnel, we exist, we're here. In terms of like looking for humor, and I really like that you brought up humor because humor is one of the things that helps us to de-stress, just laughter, being around people, laughing, having a good time. And yes, we may no longer have like the nights of a thousand laugh of old or things like that, or people may have been priced out. But again, we do have the internet that has access to these things that are now recorded. So even if you want to watch, say, Agro Dad from 10 years ago, you can find that on YouTube, All right? Another important thing is community. So laughter is not the only thing that helps community, your friends, your family, really leaning into your social support networks is really important to prioritize your mental health. So you may not be able to afford maybe going to restaurants as often as you used to, but you can have your friends over at your house, you can host, you can be with your friends do a little get together, right? Again, resilience is about finding what we can do within our existing reality and, you know, not living in the old that is no longer our reality. Well, well, uh in the, back in the day, we we would find children, you know, gathering mostly in the evenings uh, under the moonlight, sharing stories, uh, playing, and and all of that. But with modern times and a lot of urbanization in the country, mm. it, it appears that uh, that tradition is lost. Mm. What effect mm. is this having on the mental health of children? where mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't really have access to playing outside anymore they don't mm -hmm. get to meet their friends and do what kids should do mm -hmm. and everyone mm -hmm. is just focused on their on their phones or tabs and mm -hmm. it's like they are lost in a digital space mm -hmm. all day long mm -hmm. this is so bad because i was talking about this recently about how the parents of today don't have a handbook for how to parent right in the world that we live in right now and so you, again you have to live within your existing reality Right, in terms of organization, that is like really, it's real, right? Like we don't longer have like the outside the moonlight. But then again, in the less urban centers that exist, I was recently at my hometown, children are still very much outside, children are still very much clean, right? So in very urban cities, if you live in the Abujas, the Potapas, the Lagos, then you have to create a playtime for your children, right? So they go to school, right? So they are around other children, they are playing, right? And when they're home as a parent, you have to be the one to navigate their use of, say, electronic devices, social media, all those kinds of things. You can't leave it in the hand of the internet. You can't leave your child to be raised by the internet. You also have to be intentional within that. And the thing with children is children device play for themselves, right? If you've ever been around as much as two toddlers, they will find a way to play by themselves. So I think we as adults, you know, it's very different from how we grew up in the terms of you could walk out into the street, there was not as much insecurity, your parents would feel comfortable letting you just wander. But the children of today are still playing, right? And then different mental health outcomes in the next generation or two, very, very true, very, very valid. But there is not a lack of play or non-existence of play for children. Parents and adults just need to be more intentional in curating what exists right now in the time we live in. Well, well, the current life expectancy for an adult in Nigeria is pegged at about uh, 56 years, which is mm -hmm. uh, quite low uh, compared to what used to be obtainable. I mean, th th there mm -hmm. were times when people used to live to up to 190-something. I know people still live up to that uh, mm -hmm. number of years now, but the number mm -hmm. seems to be drastically dropping every day. Mm -hmm. what, what would you attribute this a uh, strange drop in life expectancy mm. in the country too. Mm. Um, so there are multiple theories that exist, multiple things that we can speak to, but I will speak within my area of work and expertise, right? In terms of the mental health strain of the country in general, right? In terms of the physical health outcomes, right? So the country has gotten increasingly more stressful. The middle class is shrinking. 
people's buying power is shrinking, right? Um, disposable income continues to shrink. You have more and more out of school use, unemployment rates, and the largest population of people in the country right now are youths, right? So if you have youths that are not maximizing their young years, they're getting into adulthood, they're becoming elders or getting into their 30s, 40s, the millennials, the boomers, and things are not just looking up. So for example, a person in Lagos wakes up by say 3, 4 a.m., They've gotten into the bus, the BIT, you see people sleeping for hours on ends in the buses. They get to their office. It's not a good job. It's not a job that gives them fulfillment. It's not a job that gives them joy. They, you know, are yelled at by their boss. There are no like stringent HR policies or like industry policies that can protect them. And so you're working at a job you really hate to a boss you don't like, you know, going back home, displacing that anger at your family, your kids, the cycle of trauma continues, massive hierarchy of needs, you're barely going past level one, which is just food and shelter. And so it tracks, right? When you look two, three decades into that kind of lifestyle of very early mornings, traffic, very high stress, very high cortisol levels, you can't afford the medications you need, it tracks that people will be passing away early just because their entirety of their life, if you write it out as a life story, wasn't a healthy one in totality. Yes, they were living, you know, yes, they were surviving, maybe they were existing, but they didn't have a good life in total. And so more and more, the mental will affect the physical, the physical will affect the mental, and then people pass early. So, yeah. now, 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 Angel, there's a statistics on the condition of mental health in Nigeria okay. uh, where it says about 25 to 30 percent of Nigerians suffer from mental illness and less than 10 percent of this population have access to professional assistance. Now, mm -hmm. uh, the, the World Health Organization estimates that about 3% of the government's budget and health goes to mental health. Uh, this is just an assertion, an estimate. In terms of mental health, which I believe you've worked with a lot of people who have had anxiety issues, who have had panic attacks and the rest. I personally know um, a, a number of people who have had, you know, uh, mental health crisis. And it's mostly not a good look. It, it affects okay. their personal lives, affects their work life and all that. How can we raise more awareness towards mental health to ensure that as much as we take physical health seriously mental mm. health is also uh, taken into consideration mm. good question um so the thing we're talking about mental health <clears throat> in nigeria is you have to address it as a systemic conversation if you have it in a silo if you have it as just one thing you're not going to get to the crux of it right and so when you address mental health conditions systemically you look at culture you look at religion right so even 20, 30, 40 years ago, this conversation would probably not be happening in the way that it is, all right? So mental health is still something that in Nigeria is still quite hush hush. Now with the internet, people are becoming more aware. So you hear like, I have like older people who will say, oh, I'm more aware of what my teenager is going through now or what my young adult is going through now because they have the internet, right? So the internet is doing a lot of desensitization all on its own. But even aside that on a cultural scale, right, on a religious scale, we have to destigmatize certain mental health conditions, right? So we're a very religious society, we're a society that believes a lot in religion, right? And when you tie those things to mental health, you have people continue to keep it under the carpet, under the rug, right? So to raise more awareness would be, you know, eliciting, you know, our cultural bodies, our religious bodies, and saying, okay, these things exist, right? It doesn't have to be either or. We can coexist at the same time. We can help at the same time. You can do your counseling. The therapist can do their therapy, right? A person can be on psychiatric medication and not, you know, be a deterrent to society or just, you know, be able to function, right? So the more we have these conversations, the more people are more open about, you know, being in therapy, seeking mental health services. The government is involved, you know, increasing the health budget. Um, being very aware that it's a population of 200 million plus, plus people, right? The more we're able to um, pay our staff properly, pay the psychiatrists properly, pay the mental health nurses properly so everybody's leaving the country, then we can start to see systemic change. Right now, we do have pockets of change, which is very helpful and very good. But on a systemic level, you can't get to mass change if you're not doing mass kind of desensitization or awareness. Well, well, we know that one of the major uh, causes, apart from uh, hereditary causes of 
uh, uh, stress-related um, anxiety and depression mm. could be idleness. And with the rate of unemployment in the country, a lot of young people are not engaged or meaningfully engaged in either a corporate space or a technical space, mm -hmm. thereby leading up to this anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. and the likes. How do we create an enabling environment where people keep their hands busy, keep mm -hmm. their minds busy, and rid mm -hmm. themselves of this issue of uh, mm -hmm. depression and, and anxiety? Yeah, so when we talk about like mental health conditions, right, there are clinical diagnoses, right, in terms of like depression as a clinical diagnosis, and there is the feeling of anxiety, right? So for example, if you're coming for a talk like this, it's normal to feel nervous, it's normal to feel a bit anxious, right? So we have to be able to first of all know that certain things are disorders and clinically diagnosed, and it's okay to have not so great feelings sometimes, right? Now in terms of me talking about unemployment and you know how that contributes to anxiety depression, I really like you know Abraham's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which basically talks about the tiers of needs that human beings need for actualization or fulfillment. On the lowest level of that, you have food, shelter, you know, just protection, transportation, all those basic things. And for the average Nigerian of today, that is not within reach. So if we're not even reaching level one, if the government isn't providing jobs, if people don't have things to do, of course we're going to see rising crisis level mental health numbers because the hierarchy of needs is not being established, right? If people cannot afford food, then how are they going to perhaps they get married, which is, you know, um, the needs of partnership, right? How are people going to have needs of belongingness if they don't feel like they belong in a community because, oh, all my friends are doing this and I haven't done this because I'm still in school for five, six, seven years, right? So again, this conversation cannot exist in, a, in one place, it's not in one vacuum, right? You can have people graduating at 14, 15, 16, and then entering school at, say, 20 because they've written jam four times, and then they're in university for five, six, seven years, and then they come out and there's no place in the job market, and then be surprised that they have anxiety and depression, right? It tracks because, you know, that person's first decade of adulthood, two decades of adulthood, is wasted. They then eventually get a job. They're in traffic all the time. Their salary is increasing by, you know, peanuts, and then dollar rate is going up when export-based economy, right? So again, systemic conversations lead to systemic change. You can't have individual conversations and expect systemic level change. Well, well Angel, we have just a few minutes to uh, wrap up this conversation. Uh, what is the place of drug abuse in uh, this whole topic of discussion? Considering mm -hmm. the fact that most people resort to uh, recreational drugs to douse mm -hmm. the effects of the current hardship and mm. unrest in the country mm -hmm. to mm. sort of move their mind away from all of this. Mm. How do we address mm. this problem? Um, so the question of like, why are people seeking, you know, these drugs, where is drug seeking behavior coming from? Again, based on everything we just said, right? We can go into like the pleasure centers of the brain and, you know, what drugs do, but that's you know, not important right now, right? But people seek these things because again, hopelessness, helplessness, Right. And like we're popularly, popularly called the Sasha's economy right now. Everything is a Sasha's, right? So your drinks, you know, if you can't buy the bottle, you can get a Sasha's. And for that brief moment of time, it gives people an escape. It gives people somewhere to go, right? Which is like, if I can't, you know, I have debts to pay, I have rights to pay, I have school fees to pay, my children are crying for food. I don't want to deal with this right now. I'm just going to drink something, I'm going to smoke something, and just get a place of escape. So there is a very big drug problem in Nigeria and it cuts across ages, it cuts across demographics, it cuts across socioeconomic status, right? But again, the government has a lot of role to play in ensuring that we're handling this systemically. So if I were to answer how to address drug abuse in teenagers, it would be different from how I'm addressing drug abuse among people in their 50s and 60s, because it exists there too, right? So you, you have to look at what is happening to that demographic, why are they doing the things they do, we have a very big youth population like we've talked about. So what is happening to the youth? They are unemployed, they don't have jobs, they're not getting partnered, you know, the economy is becoming very tough, exams are becoming very tough, everything is just really tough. So of course you will see rising levels of you know drug abuse because of all these things. So to break it down, the government has its role to play, individuals have their role to play, but the government has a big role to play in unraveling drug abuse in Nigeria. All right, Angel Yin Corey, I must thank you very much for finding the time to come on the program and sharing your wealth of experience in uh, raising mental health awareness uh, in the country.
Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's Have been a, a pleasure. Day. Thank you. <laughs>